Yeah, thanks to the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here today and for putting together this very nice workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about some theoretical developments that are happening uh, recently and that we have to continue as we move forward. And we are trying to summarize in uh, a white paper that is coming up. The topic that we're really dealing with here is um, the, the path forward to do percent level phenomenology at the LHC. Uh, the reason why we're interested in that is really that uh, the LHC will deliver uh, for us measurements at the percent level for a fairly uh, sizable set of observables. And you can think about this uh, just from the fundamental limitations that we are actually exposed to at the LHC. For example, the luminosity, just the amount of uh, pardon uh, collisions that we have at the LHC, we can determine it at the percent level. Another uncertainty that is afflicting, let's say 1,500 uh, papers uh, so far is uh, the determination of the energy scale of a jet that we observe. Uh, and we can determine this quantity at the level of uh, uh, a couple of percent as well. You also have to keep in mind that statistics is going to be less and less of a problem as we move forward in time, because uh, the current data set that we have of 140 inverse femto band, we are essentially to, uh, uh, at a 20 fold of that until the end of the high luminosity phase of the LHC. So statistics for a lot of observables is going to become less of a problem. And uh, we are going to enter, at least for some observables, a systematics dominated phase. Um, so uh, percent level phenomenology can do a lot of things for us uh, that are interesting uh, from a physics point of view. We will determine the properties of the Higgs. Uh, here you see some coupling constants to remarkable uh, precision. We are, for example, already measuring Higgs couplings at the level of uh, 6 to 11 uh, percent here, and we're going to determine them uh, by the end of the high luminosity phase of the LHC to better than 2 percent. We will do a lot of uh, standard model precision measurements that actually tell us, can we establish the standard model at the percent level? Can we really understand this theory? Do we understand it by measuring lots of very uh, clean final states that are associated with set bosons, W bosons, top quarks, and jets and combinations thereof to extremely high accuracy? And we can do uh, tests of uh, fundamental relations that the standard model provides us uh, and see if we actually understand what's going on. And of course, we want to look for deviations for new physics that is out there, for example, by constraining operators in uh, standard model effective field theories and searching for deviations um, of the physics that we know and love. Um, the way we do this, the, the, uh, the formula that enables us to compare theory and experiment at the LHC is this uh, general factorization formula that allows us to relate hadronic observables uh, to partonic observables that we can calculate from the standard model of particle physics by convoluting with parton distribution functions. And uh, in particular, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, here today is uh, uh, the way we calculate these partonic cross-sections. Uh, we do this by perturbative quantum field theory. And in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, strong uh, QCD corrections to this partonic cross-section. Uh, alpha S is our uh, largest of all our small parameters. Uh, so it's going to give us the dominant corrections as we calculate in perturbative corrections. And in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, an expansion here uh, like this, where we write down a leading order term, correct with the next leading order term, and so on. And finally, move to n cubed below corrections with alpha s cubed in front. And I'm going to uh, argue that uh, this is something that the field will have to spend some time on uh, over the next decade to develop the technology and the tools to actually go to this order uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, fairly widespread percent level phenomenology. And cube the loop uh, corrections, the capability to do this for hadron collider production processes is something that is fairly new. We've been uh, starting doing this in, in 2015, and uh, ever since then, this is ramping up a bit, and there's uh, um, more and more papers that are coming out. But so far, the observables that we have been looking at are fairly idealized quantities. They are um, essentially inclusive cross sections, so neglecting detector effects or final state cuts. Um, or any complications like that. And we're looking only at the single bosons, single uh, colorless final states that uh, we are producing at the LHC. Um, the first fully differential predictions are coming out, but this are really just the first uh, walking attempts at this perturbative order. Uh, the status uh, looks roughly like that. I'm listing here a couple of example processes that you can think of uh, as uh, representative for LHC processes. You see in this column here, uh, Higgs boson production and brilliant production. You see in this column here, uh, the ratio essentially of n cubed to corrections over next to next to leading order predictions. And you can see that adding this uh, last order, uh, this frontier and perturbation theory changes the, the value of the predicted cross section at the level of a couple of percent. Residual uncertainties associated with the truncation of the perturbative series are again at the percent level. Other uncertainties that are derived from partner distribution functions, uh, the strong, the, our, our imperfect knowledge of the strong coupling constant and so on, of, con uh, of comparable uh, order of magnitude. 
So the takeaway is in cubital corrections um, are percent level, uh, residual uncertainties are also at the percent level, a little bit smaller than that. Um, overall, we see that including these corrections improves the description of data that we have available and other uncertainties become of a, a comparable size. So if you want to do percent level phenomenology at the LHC for a fairly sizable set of clean final states, we will have to include um, this at a much uh, wider uh, range as we are currently able to do this. And um, the, the, uh, I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides uh, very briefly uh, what is necessary, what are the bottlenecks currently that we are facing, uh, and what, uh, how we are thinking about this problem. Essentially, I want to do this by looking again at this factorization formula here, where I'm relating, again, part and distribution function to an integration over any kind of final state particles that we don't really want to observe or measure over uh, scattering amplitude, scattering matrix elements that we can calculate from first principle. Uh, calculating the scattering matrix elements is one of the bottlenecks that, uh, that we actually have to address. Um, we have to, in order for, to do encubital calculations, we have to calculate the free loop and two loop uh, scattering amplitudes. Recently, we have seen progress uh, to, in, in, uh, in this arena that allowed us to write down encubital calculations, free loop calculations for two to two master scattering amplitudes and uh, two loop uh, calculations for five particle uh, scattering amplitudes, even with uh, an off shell uh, leg on top of that. But essentially, um, uh, the calculating this, uh, these amplitudes is something that is highly challenging, uh, that is uh, still something that is uh, fairly far from automated and um, is done on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's really necessary for us to come up with representations that are numerically fast and stable and reliable and we can include into, um, into uh, computing tools uh, that allow us to do uh, phenomenology in an, easy, in an easy fashion. There are complications uh, in this business uh, like... Uh, the fact that the function basis that we're using to express this, this scattering amplitudes is changing as we make our problem more and more complicated. Um, functions like multiple poly logarithms that we understood well, that we knew how to evaluate, calculate, analytically continue and so on, are not sufficient anymore. There are generalizations there are in there now that we call, for example, elliptic multiple poly logarithms and other beasts that are in there that we have to learn to understand and to uh, tackle in a similar fashion. Um, another problem that is uh, causing us quite a headache is the integration of our final state particles. Um, the, in the end, this is uh, induced by the fact that we are separating different multipli multiplicative, uh, multiplicity final states from each other. And when we are combining things, uh, we encounter soft and collinear singularities in our integration. So this is uh, just a very textbook fact that uh, we have to deal with. And the problem is that the complexity as we go to higher and higher orders in perturbation theory is just growing immensely. And today, um, as a consequence of that, if you want to do state-of-the-art uh, precision calculations, we are, you know, almost getting used to spending a million CPU hours on the calculation. And a million CPU hours is, is an amount that is not really, you know, easy to change um, a, a cut anymore or to change the analysis or to play around with the code or something like that. You need serious infrastructure in order to do um, this kind of calculations. And one of the things that I really think is possible here is to really think about it differently and change this around. And I think there's a lot of room for theoretical process in particular for um, this point here. There are currently two uh, techniques or two frameworks, uh, uh, meta techniques, let's say, available on the market, slicing and subtraction techniques. I'm not going to get into them. Uh, there's a couple of slides in the backup if you want to, if you're interested in, in recent developments in that. Um, one more item that I want to highlight really uh, are part and distribution functions. There's a lot happening in terms of part and distribution functions. The LHC provides a, a very nice feedback loop for us. Um, here you see the uncertainty on the probability to pick two gluons out of the colliding protons at the LHC as it was uh, uh, constrained uh, in 2015 in the red band and uh, the 2020 results are the yellow one. Uh, and you can see that the bands are shrinking, meaning, meaning that the uncertainty is shrinking. We get to um, have a better understanding of, uh, of the structure of the protons. Um, one thing that is currently a problem for us when we want to do encubital calculations is that we really don't have encubital PDFs available and we are quantifying uncertainties according to that. Uh, and uh, here you see the uncertainty on the W boson production cross section as a function of the invariant mass of the final state. And around this pink line where the W boson mass is, you see that this green arrow gives you roughly a 2% uncertainty that we could remove if we had encubital PDFs. Um, to generate those, however, um, we need uh, a calculation of four-loop splitting functions. We need the uh, encubital predictions for a large range of a global data set. 
We need efficient techniques in order to extract partner distribution functions from this global data set. And a lot of development has to go into this uh, in terms of other uncertainties, other effects that we are Excellent. currently not really dealing with so much. And there's an entire white paper that's dedicated to that um, in the larger setting. Um, there's many more things that we need to do if we want to reach this level of uh, phenomenological precision that I don't really have, unfortunately, the time to talk about today. I just uh, I'm airing a little bit of laundry list here, and uh, we can talk about this more in case you're interested. There are many things like uh, making this uh, frameworks accessible to um, to users at the LHC community, really uh, providing tools to the experimental community to download them, to run these codes, to get these predictions out of them. It is a huge issue. We have to think about uh, electroweak effects, mass effects. We have to deal with uh, theoretical conceptual problems that are coming in at the below in terms of factorization violation that haven't been um, as much of a problem at lower orders. We want to think about uh, reordering uh, the perturbative expansion in invert sensitive limits and combined with resumation techniques. Um, there's a huge uh, problem of how we think about uh, uh, uncertainties, theoretical uncertainties. Chess was alluding to that earlier today. Um, we can think about uh, corrections beyond the leading power for factorization theorems and so on. Uh, and with that, uh, I come to my conclusions. Um, the LHC will deliver for us a window into electroweak physics at uh, the percent precision uh, level. Um, to fully exploit it, we need the uh, phenomenological predictions adding cube below. Uh, many advancements and the advancement and the community effort are required over the next decade. And uh, I showed you. Uh, some major immediate bottlenecks that we will have to tackle in order to get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Questions from the room? Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, this is Hank Lamb from Framilab. So you have terrified me by telling me you need hundreds of millions of CPU hours to do in 3LO. <laughs> Am I sort of going to shoot up some point in, in 4LO or in 5LO where we say humanity cannot compute the things we need to compare to get the experiments we're going to be wanting to do someday? Or do you have optimism that these numbers will all come down to remain tractable in the lifetime of normal people? So uh, what we've seen in the past is indeed that there's a lot of uh, developments actually happening that uh, allow us to do this calculation in a more stable and in a more uh, computer tractable fashion. Um, Jesse was talking about uh, ways using uh, neural networks uh, uh, earlier today in order to do Monte Carlo uh, integration and uh, get better optimization of, uh, of uh, let's say, bigger sampling algorithms that can, that can happen a lot with this, these problems, let's say. There's uh, optimizations that we can do on a purely theoretical level where we can just understand better how to group together infrared and collinear singularities and, you know, make the, the, the way we are handling our calculations more um, attuned to the way perturbation theory actually uh, works and there's new algorithms that we can cook up that uh, actually allow us to do this uh, this uh, combination of different multiplicity states in a, in a better improved fashion that uh, can really help uh, uh, reduce uh, these numbers that you're seeing here and you know we've seen that there's a lot of progress uh, that uh, wasn't necessary in order to do even just next to next leading order calculations and we are pushing this forward and uh, hoping that we get these numbers down thanks Bernard, thanks for the great results, Jesse Thaler. Um, the, uh, you just alluded to better ways of organizing soft and collinear divergences, which kind of connects to slicing and subtractions, and you, and you hinted at backup slides. Um, oh, it, no, it, the backup slides are purely, um, you oh. know, what, <laughs> there's, what happened already. There's no... Okay. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so what you just said, uh, we'll have to wait for, uh, for future yeah. work about how you do that reorganization. Thanks. thanks. More questions? Are there any questions from Zoom, actually? No, okay. More from the room? So I have a question associated with the computational resources. What do you think we will need to extend n 3 calculations to the 2 to 2 processes? You talked primarily about 2 to 1. Next step is 2 to 2. Excellent. What do you think we'll need? Yeah, I think that... Uh... I think there needs to be some appreciation that uh, these things are going to consume a fairly large amount of uh, computing power uh, as we are uh, moving forward. This is more clear, I think, to the community in terms of partner Java Monte Carlo generators. And I think this is something that we will have to factor in uh, that this is going to be a, an issue as well for, uh, for fixed order calculations. 
right now there are a couple of institutes that are lucky enough to have uh, big clusters, big farms that can run these codes. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we, we should keep this in mind as we are uh, structuring uh, calculations, let's say in the form of, uh, uh, you know, large uh, cluster access for such LHC calculations in the US. And uh, yeah, and the median CPU hours, you mentioned this, this is for two to one. That's what you have seen in this practice is for already. fully differential two to one processes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. One more applause.